And on a bright sunny day like today, the stone really seems to shimmer. What's fascinating about these sculptures is their position so that they're all activated by the sun at different times of the day. So it's about mid-morning now. That sculpture back there is in complete shadow. And this one over here, it was in shadow about 10 minutes ago, but now the sun has just come around the edge and it is creating this glorious raking light across the surface of the slate. The Sheepfold Project is a reminder of that ancient link between culture and agriculture. After all, the building of dry stone walls, and indeed farming itself, is an intensely sculptural activity. And like art, it too can be beautiful. Andy Goldsworthy lives and works not far from the Cumbrian Hills, in the Scottish borders. Every morning he walks out into the fields around his home to make a work in the landscape. And today, I'm joining him. He hopes to produce an ambitious but risky piece, building a vertical stone wall into the shell of a dead oak tree. The reason why I love to work with my hands is that friction. There is this terrific, wonderful resistance to the land that challenges you. It creates sensations and feelings that inform me as an artist. What I do love about walls is the way they're made, stone by stone. They're a great lesson to sculptors. They use the stone from the place, they use the stone for its structure, and the line that they often take will draw the landscape. So they're, they're very much an expression of the landscape. But despite his deep knowledge of wall making, this particular work is proving extremely challenging. So Andy, you've been working on this for four and a half, five hours now. It looks fantastic to me. What's your verdict? I think it's probably not gonna... going to succeed. I'm getting closer to the top. It was closer than the last collapse. I've got a better sense of the the tree and there's certain aspects of it that I am not entirely happy. I begin to really enjoy this kind of line that between the stone and the wood. You know, so that rates really well. So whilst I would probably be, I'm not going to be entirely happy if it does fall down, it does give me the chance to go back down to there and get it reworked. And if it does fall, you'll start again? I might start, I, mean, I think it's probably reached a point in the day where it would be better coming in. And for, this is a work that I can come back to, unlike a lot of the things that I make, that it's a one-off that time only to make that particular work. Andy continues to build the wall upwards. But then, after hours of hard work, what he feared happens. Oh.
Normally with a collapse like that, I would be feeling a little devastated and whilst I would have loved to have got this uh, completed, I think that uh, it's probably um, for the better in that I can get back and rework some of this, but it's not, I'm not, I haven't got the energy to do that again today. I've seen something today that really reminded me of what art can be. No dealer, no gallery, no pretentious display caption. A man simply walked out one morning into nature, found inspiration, and made something really rather wonderful. Andy Goldsworthy's piece didn't last more than a few hours. But that, I think, is precisely what makes it so special. Because like nature itself, his work is in a state of perpetual change. Several months later, Andy attempted the tree wall again and comes within inches of completing it. Seeing Andy's piece collapse again is heartbreaking, but his determination to succeed is an inspiration. You know, perfection's really easy to do, but it's a matter of how much time you have to put into achieving that perfection. And I think that every day I go out, uh, there is a sort of compromise with the, the day. We collaborated with nature in the forest. We intervened in nature in the field. But here, on the coast, it can often feel like a battle. The repeated clash of water and rock has sculpted the perimeter of our land and will continue to do so long after we are gone. But in this turbulent environment, one artist has tested herself and her art against the rhythms of the sea. In the early 1990s, Julie Brooke spent two years living in a cave on the island of Jura, off the west coast of Scotland. Her intention was to capture the harsh beauty of the island in paint but the experience of living in solitude in such an exposed landscape changed the way she made and thought about her practice. She wanted to create a kind of art that encapsulated the elemental forces that were all around her. The result was an extraordinary combination of fire, stone and water, what Julie Brooke called her fire stacks. I've made the long journey across Britain to the Outer Hebrides, a landscape of rugged mountains and spectacular sea lochs. It's far from any road and two hours hike from the nearest track. This is one of the most remote parts of the British Isles. 
That over there, that's the Atlantic Ocean. And I've come here because after 25 years, Julie Brook is once again making a fire stack. Julie has been here for several days already, in all weathers, collecting stones to build the stack, as well as fuel to burn. She can only build at low tide, and twice a day she has to surrender her progress to the sea. So, Julie. Wow, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it is the most remote place I can possibly imagine. <laughs> can you tell me where we are and, and what this yes, place actually it, is? It's a, it's a very remote part on the west side of Lewis, just sort of um, uh, with North Paris just on its edge. And we're looking right out to the Western Atlantic. So that's the Atlantic uh, nothing, out there. Yes, nothing much beyond there, apart from when you um, get to America, I guess. It does um, feel like a full ocean of wind is yeah, <laughs> hitting us yeah. right now. How long have you been making this? Well, um, five, six days of building this particular stack and then um, a previous 10 days of building um, another series prior to that to uh, get a sense of the tides here, the way the water flows, the way the tides are coming in. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're labour intensive. So now this fire stack's up and running, what is going to happen next? Well, you'll see the tide is just beginning to come to the base of it, which is really exciting. So I'm going to start lighting it quite soon. And then you get this extraordinary quality of, of, you know, the elements all coming together. So you've got the water surrounding the fire and stone. And then gradually you watch it rising and you get this incredible ribbons of light from the reflection of the fire. And it, it's sort of so much about rhythm. It's like marking rhythm and marking time um, in such an elemental way. With the tide rising fast, Julie is keen to start the fire. The fire stack works can be dangerous and unpredictable. A sudden shift in weather could destroy everything in an instant. Julie makes countless journeys out into the freezing sea to build up the fire, like a silent vigil engulfed by flame and smoke. I remember when I first lit one successfully, it felt so absolutely true. I felt that I was sort of connecting with something incredibly ancient without specifically knowing what that was. That connection with nature that some people around the world still have very, very strongly is a very profound thing. By working and committing and inhabiting the landscape, in a sense, I'm looking for that connection that I see crofters have here or fishermen have here. And I think it's something about the purity of that. Humans have made markers on the coast for millennia. Stone cairns, flaming beacons, monoliths, lighthouses. And for me, the fire stack seems to tap into those ancient practices. It too is a marker of human presence. With the fire burning brightly, Julie makes her last journey to the stack. And then she retreats, leaving the elements to decide its fate. As the sun begins to set, the fire's reflections dance on the sea like liquid gold. For a few glorious moments, the elements are in perfect balance, and the result is spellbinding. <laughs> 